Hello world, and Dr. D from ACU here. Let's talk about thermodynamics. I've always been fascinated by temperature and heat. Our department a few years ago bought a thermal imaging camera and it's been one of my absolute favorite things to play with. I promise someday I'm gonna make a video of all the cool things that we can do with it. But when I take it home and play with it, you see the world in a different way. Uh, this is my cat Nibbler with his cold nose and his glowing demon eyes. He rolled over on his back so we could scientifically prove that his belly is warm and fuzzy. And then he got annoyed with me for having a camera in his face. And he got up and left and you can see his paw prints walking away on the top of the screen. Uh, a few months later, my son was homesick with a fever. And I thought, oh, that is awful. I'm going to go get my thermal imaging camera. And I ran back, and sure enough, there's my wife Googling his symptoms on her phone, and there's my son glowing hot running a fever that afternoon. So let's talk a little bit about temperature and heat and how this actually works. And we'll do this for a series of videos about thermodynamics and try to explain a lot of really interesting things about our universe. Okay, some backstory. 1724, Daniel Fahrenheit bases his scale on three points. He calls the mixture of ice, water, and salt zero. He makes ice 32 and his wife's armpit as 96. If you've ever wondered why our body temperature is 98.6, there you go. Why did he use those weird numbers? Why didn't he call it 100 or 10? Well, it turns out his original thermometer had 12 marks. Then he made one that was more precise, so it had 24 marks, and then one that was doubly precise, so it had 48, and doubled again to 96. In the U.S. here, we are in small but excellent company. The Fahrenheit scale is used only in the U.S., some Caribbean islands, and Liberia. The rest of the world uses freedom units of Celsius. Now, not long after Fahrenheit did his work, astronomer Anders Celsius makes his scale, and check this out, zero degrees for boiling, 100 for freezing. That's not a typo. That's what he did. Fortunately, when he died, Linnaeus, you might know him from biology, reversed it to what we know today. The moral of this story, kids, is if you don't like what your advisor or your professor is doing, just wait till they die and change it. Now, this used to be called the centigrade scale. That means just 100 marks. Now it's been officially renamed Celsius, but you may sometimes hear people refer to it as centigrade. So it turns out Fahrenheit and Celsius are really obnoxious to work with for formulas. Imagine I'm going to have a formula that has a T in it for temperature, and my T can be positive or negative or zero. And if it's zero, I can never, ever divide by T. It just breaks all the math. Let's make something that's positive definite, makes life easy. So about 100 years after Celsius, William Thompson, the first Baron of Largs, Lord Kelvin, and they don't name scientists like that anymore, introduces the idea of absolute zero. So let's think about this for a little bit. Imagine I have an experiment where I'm measuring the pressure of some kind of gas versus temperature. And I find as my temperature goes up, so does my pressure. And as my temperature goes down, so does my pressure. Well, how small can pressure go? Well, I guess zero is the theoretical limit. I don't know what negative pressure would mean. So you kind of extrapolate out to where negative pressure would be. And he said negative 273.15. So we called that absolute zero. Now, a couple of uh, footnotes to this story. So first off, a guy named Rankin did this with the Fahrenheit scale 11 years later. Eh, no one really cares today. I've never seen the Rankin scale in use in the wild. Now, is absolute zero really the lower limit? Well, it's complicated. We can technically make some systems where I have to add energy to it to bring them up to absolute zero temperature. So we can go below, kind of. Some rules can be bent, and this is one of them. But really what it means is temperature doesn't make a lot of sense at very small scales. In fact, even defining temperature rigorously with thermodynamics is really hard and kind of unsatisfying at first. But you do get shivers down your spine when you finally figure it out. 
Okay, so what about negative pressure? Would that be possible? Well, it turns out that as far as we know, about two-thirds of the universe is made up of something called dark energy that we know absolutely nothing about except that it does have negative pressure, and we find that really weird and really awesome. Now, while we're talking about this, I can't not mention that the world's highest man-made temperature records belong to the Atom Smashers. So the Atom Smasher, where I got my PhD and have been working for a long time, had the official Guinness World Record for a good long while. That record now belongs to the Large Hadron Collider over in CERN. Now, for the world's smallest temperatures, it turns out we have a lot of amazing tricks, but you can actually cool something off, if you're very careful, by blasting it with a laser. And that's just kind of awesome. So what does temperature do? Well, you probably know that the length of an object can change with temperature. So if I define my variables this way, where delta L is the amount of temperature change from my original length of L0, Delta T is the change of temperature in either Celsius or Kelvin. I can use either one, but definitely not Fahrenheit. And alpha is some constant based on the material. Then we have this really nice relationship. It turns out the Eiffel Tower will grow or shrink by several inches from winter to summer because of linear expansion. You might drive across a bridge that has these expansion joints because that bridge will get several inches longer in the summer and several inches shorter in the winter, and we don't want any cracks to develop in the bridge. So if you have these problems, go look up alpha online, and you can calculate what's going to happen. Similarly with volume, we have an equation that's basically identical. The change in volume delta V is some constant beta, times the original volume times a change in temperature. For lots of substances, beta is equal to 3 times alpha, as it needs to be for a change. Now, one of the weirdest things in the universe turns out to be water. Water does something that almost nothing else in the universe does. That is, when you get it really cold, it will shrink and then expand and then shrink. Now the fact that water does this does some really weird things. So first off, ice cubes float. If water actually made sense, solid ice would be denser than liquid water, but it's not. It also means then that when it gets really cold outside, lakes and ponds, and maybe even if it were really cold, a small ocean or two, would freeze from the bottom up instead of from the top down. And so if water didn't have this weird property where as it cools, the coldest water is less dense, so it goes up to the surface, so lakes and ponds freeze from the top down, it might be really hard to have a planet that evolved any kind of aquatic life. And then, of course, come wintertime. You know that if I have a pipe that's sitting outside, as that water freezes, it will expand while my pipe is contracting, could cause it to explode. All right, that's temperature. Let's talk about heat. A weird definition. I turned a sentence into three bullet points. Heat is the transfer of energy, so it has units of joules, that flows from a high to a low temperature object spontaneously. Now let's unpack this a little bit. The way that we use the word heat in English is not at all precise with what the real definition means. So first off, heat is an energy, but it's a transfer. I don't talk about an object storing heat or being hot. When I say it's hot, that has nothing to do with heat. It has to do with temperature. Heat is only when energy is flowing from one thing to another thing. And that flow has to happen from high to low temperature, and it has to happen automatically, spontaneously. Now you could ask, why does heat go from hot to cold? Couldn't I just have a pail of water where all of a sudden heat rushes out from one part and an ice cube forms in the middle? Well, that wouldn't violate conservation of energy. And we'll try to explain exactly why heat does that in a few videos now. So, one of the weird consequences of this definition of heat, your microwave doesn't actually use heat to heat up your food. 
Right, if heat is based on a high to low temperature, if my microwave is room temperature and I put in a cup of water at room temperature, there can be no heat. Yet my water gets hot. It's as though there's some other way that we have talked about that I can give energy to some object. Okay, so how do we relate heat and temperature? Well, in most cases, we use the heat capacity formula. Q equals mc delta t. So in this case, the capital letter Q is going to be our variable for heat. It's energy in joules, but remember, it's a transfer. So I'm giving an object heat or I'm removing heat from an object. M is going to be the mass in kilograms, C is the heat capacity, and again, delta T is the temperature change in Celsius or Kelvin, and those deltas are the same in either unit. Heat is energy, so it must be conserved. A simple problem would say, I give an object 10 joules of heat, what's its final temperature? But a more complex problem might have a hot thing and a cold thing, and when you have these problems, they're pretty easy to solve, just conserve energy. Write Q in equals Q out. The heat that leaves the hot thing is the exact same amount of heat that goes into the cold thing. Conservation of energy is your friend in thermodynamics. Now if I heat something up too much, I'm going to cause a phase change. So if I were to go from a solid and heat it up until it melted and became liquid, or from a liquid until it became a gas, what I would find is, during that phase change, where my ice is melting or my water is boiling, the temperature is constant. And I'm adding heat to make the phase change happen, but that happens at a constant T. Now since T equals zero, we can't use our heat capacity equation. We've got to use something else. So we call this latent heat. How much heat is required to make a phase change happen? So in this case, I take my Q, the mass M of the substance, and L is this latent heat constant that I can look up for something. So I want to know how much heat I need to boil water. I look at the L for water, multiply by the mass, and I'm good to go. Today, we talked about temperature scales, Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin. Be familiar with those. We did linear and volume thermal expansion, a simple equation to calculate how much things will stretch or shrink. The most important idea here is the definition of heat as a transfer of energy and the ways that we can calculate that with heat capacity and latent heat. We'll talk more about how heat transfer works next time. Thanks for watching.